Um, I'm Michael Atlinger. I'm the Vice President for Economic Policy at the Center for American Progress, and I will be moderating uh, this panel. Uh, I caught a bit of the last panel, and we're going to be moving from, uh, from guns to butter, I guess, or swords to plowshares or something. Um, you know, as we talk about uh, what's, how we're going to deal with the fiscal cliff, whether it's going to be a grand bargain or muddle through or whatever happens, there are a number of programs that are undoubtedly going to get particular attention that are going to be real hot potatoes uh, for one reason, because there are programs that the government does that are very much the public's uh, uh, are very aware of, and there are things that are very much in the political discussion. Um, you know, when you, for people who are pushing for substantial budget cuts in, in general, one phrase you hear is getting entitlements under control. And I think what's notable about that phrase is it doesn't have the word Social Security or Medicare in it, uh, and it implies that something is out of control. And I, I, what we will be getting into uh, on this panel, I think, in part, is what happens when you actually get beyond that phrase, and it becomes a very different discussion. Uh, I think the other thing to note is that, uh, you know, one thing is when you get into a fiscal cliff deficit discussion, there's a, a natural gravity towards making the numbers add up. And make, look, I've done this, several of us have done this. Making the numbers add up is really easy uh, if you abstract it from the consequences. And, um, you know, I think that what this discussion really is going to end up being and, and, and be forced to is, is what our society and economy really need, and some of that is our programs like the entitlement programs, but also it's things like, you know, dealing with bridges and roads and infrastructure and all the other things that the, that the federal government does. So that's what we're going to be moving the discussion to, and we have a great panel. I, I, I'd probably say that even if it was sort of not true, but it happens to be true um, uh, in this case. And in uh, you know, the order they ended up in my notes, I will introduce the uh, the panel. Uh, Mark Schmidt, there, raise your hand, um, is a senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. Uh, before that, he was an executive editor of the award-winning American Prospect magazine. He was a senior fellow at the New America Foundation. He also directed a program at the Open Society Institute, where he showed the good judgment of funding some of, some of my work. Um, uh, he was also policy director to Senator Bill Bradley and advisor to the senator's presidential campaign. Michael Lean, right here, uh, is the Whitehead Senior Fellow at the New America Foundation. He's a best-selling author, and my copy of Land of Promise is almost at the top of my, my pile, and I'm, I'm actually very much looking forward to it, because he's an excellent writer. Uh, Michael's been uh, an editor or staff writer for The New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, and The New Republic. He's published and appeared and spoken pretty much uh, everywhere and written everything. Uh, he's a much, you know, in terms of writing, everything from much acclaimed, serious, and important works on hi of history to a prize-winning children's book. Uh, Monique Morrissey, who you can probably figure out which person that is, um, uh, has been with the Economic Policy Institute since 2006, where we were colleagues for, I don't know, a year or something. Um, uh, she previously worked at the AFL-CIO's Office of Investment and the Financial Market Center. She holds a PhD in economics from American University, and her areas of concentration in her ample research and writing include retirement security, executive compensation, the Federal Reserve, and financial markets. Uh, lastly, Cheryl uh, Schwenninger uh, directs the New America Foundation's Economic Growth Program and the Global Middle Class Initiative. He is also the former director of the Bernard L. Schwartz Fellows Program. Cheryl was the founding editor of World Policy J Journal and the director of the World Policy Institute at the New School. He also served as program coordinator for the Project on Development, Trade, and International Finance at the Council of Foreign Relations, and he's also a senior fellow at the World Policy Institute. So. That's the introductions. I thought they warranted some elaboration since they are a very accomplished panel. And I think we're going to kick it off with Monique. Thank you. Um, I have a, my notes on a PowerPoint, but there are no charts. And if you can't see them, it's OK. It's basically notes to myself. Um, but uh, my title is Avoiding a Not-So-Grand Bargain. And actually, uh, Jamie Galbraith used the analogy that I was going to use, which is you're getting the hard sell from, I was going to say timeshare. He said condo. You could say rug dealer. You could say a car dealer. 
Um, but you know, his point was, and a lot of other people have mentioned this, is that you know, when you're getting the hard sell, it's time to stop and think. I would go a little further and I'd say when you're getting the hard sell, you know you're not getting the best deal you can. So in fact, don't stop and think, walk away, see what happens, and then come back. Um, and uh, and it, my particular focus, even though historically I've you know, looked at Federal Reserve stuff or something like that, really these days it's been a lot on retirement and Social Security, and so I'm particularly concerned with Social Security. Um, I thought I was going to be taking the last, uh, the, the last slot, and so um, I have sort of a, I was just going to plug in holes where people hadn't made particular points on tax expenditures or something like that. Um, but as it is, I'll try to give a little bit of an overview and then just uh, go specifically about uh, Social Security because one of my preoccupations is that many progressives even are at this point convinced that Social Security really is in trouble and also that in general that there's a big problem with aging and demographics. And I think that one of the reasons that the other side wants a deal very quickly right now um, is because, you know, for people who are anti-government ideologues, uh, you know, the New Deal programs are the jewel in the crown. If they can, they, they try to frontal attack with privatization and now they're trying to shrink it down and they, you know, they don't need, you don't really need to have private accounts formally. You can just keep shrinking social security and then talking up the need for more retirement savings in sub, you know, publicly subsidized retirement accounts and you come up with the same thing. Um, and, uh, and so I would say that, you know, in, in particular, if there's one thing I want to accomplish today is to convince you guys that there is no rush on social security, it should not be dragged in and if the Democrats do one thing right, it should be to you know, make sure that that's, uh, Social Security and, and the New Deal programs in general are left out of any uh, bargain. Um, but first, um, let's see, how do I? Uh, the, uh, I also, because I'll be skipping over a lot of this stuff very quickly, um, put in a plug for EPI publications. I also uh, neglected earlier to thank our host, which I'm uh, very grateful to be asked to, to participate here. And, um, and we all are very much like-minded. Um, but I wanted to say that uh, the Fiscal Obstacle Course by Josh Bivens and Andrew Fieldhouse is a very good overview of trade-offs. And it's also well-written, uh, which most economists don't write very well. And I uh, so I, I would say that if you just want a little bit of a, um, a, a quick um, you know, a rundown of, of some of the issues and trade-offs. Um, the other thing is the EPI helped uh, the Congressional Progressive Caucus on the budget for all. Um, this is an example of many kinds of things that EPI works on. The point is that, you know, if you're worried, if you, the main point I'm going to make today is that it's all politics, it's not economics, and these kinds of things demonstrate that there are, you know, ways of reducing the budget long term um, and that don't require, uh, you know, that are not, they're, they're not the sort of economic uh, constraints that we've been told about with a, the aging population, we need to do this, we have to, you know, uh, those trade-offs, and, and this is a short-term budget, I mean, medium, you know, a 10-year budget window, but it, it shows one way of doing it. And uh, Becky Thies is here, uh, and so if you are more interested in that, she was, uh, at one point I, brief, I actually tried to get her to be here instead of me because she works on Social Security and she works on budget issues, so she's more of an expert on these things. Um, so, um, okay, this is kind of obvious, uh, but I, as I mentioned, I don't think, uh, and one thing I wanted to mention is, uh, one of the issues is, you know, the long-term real challenge is projected health cost inflation. Um, you know, just, you know, as many people have pointed out, this, my theme is everything is politics, and one of the things that's political is the decision about what is considered a realistic projection or not. This has become very, very politicized. So, for example, the same people, and in, this includes supposedly apolitical, nonpartisan actors like the center, I mean, the Congressional Budget Office, will project forward unsustainable, and this was mentioned earlier, but unsustainable health cost inflation. Um, and meanwhile, when they, they do their more realistic projections, they will cast doubt on cost containment measures. Um, and so in other, so there's, a, there's sort of this bias built into these projections, and this is always something to keep in mind, um, you know, that projections, you know, the decision about what's a realistic assumption or not is very political, and it includes, um, you know, supposedly nonpartisan actors like the Congressional Budget Office, which does a lot of good work, but. Um, now, I, this was partly for my own purposes. Uh, this is an extremely uh, simplified, um, you know, uh, I, w I wanted to, it's a very, very cynical idea of what the Republican priorities were and the Democratic priorities were going into this, you know, grand bargain negotiations. And I, I already realized that uh, I'm, 
there's an error in there because I was just told by the last panel that the Republicans aren't really that hardcore. These are supposed to be priorities in terms of uh, averting cuts in defense spending. Um, and it's a cynical uh, perspective. I say so they, what Republicans want is they want uh, cuts in, you know, in government. They want to shrink government and drown it in the bathtub famously. Separately from that, they in particular want to get, you know, get rid of the New Deal and substitute uh, you know, what EPI, what Jared Bernstein at EPI previously called, you know, the you're on your own society. So the Republican vision was, a, a, you know, a, an ownership society where, um, and the, the, the Democratic vision, and one way to look at it is the de Democrats historically have been in favor of social insurance, which historically has been much more cost effective, and the Republicans historically have, um, you know, wanted the same subsidies funneled through private um, means, and of late, actually, the Democrats have been complicit in this, uh, expanding the size of government in, in, in health care and other um, areas, uh, but doing it in a way that sort of buys off private industry at the same time, and it's very expensive. So it's not, um, you know, if, if we really are in a belt-tightening mode, um, it's important to keep in mind it's not just the, the Pentagon um, that has not done things very cost effectively. I'm a big fan of the uh, recent health care reform, but it was, you know, one of the strong points was not uh, cost containment. And in, in addition, the cost containment measures that were there were not uh, viewed as credible. And so and that was a political decision, and partly, but partly it was, it was a function of how it was done. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I'm being cynical. I say the Republicans, it's not so much that they are, and, and this, this is, there's, you know, there's, Republicans are not a monolith, although they're closer to being a monolith than the Democrats, but some Republicans gen genuinely don't want to increase taxes on the middle class um, and genuinely don't want a double-dip recession. But I'd say that the, as a, the way that the party, the revealed preferences of the party in recent years has been that they're much more concerned about the wealthy and, you know, than they are about these things. Um, the uh, Democrats, so we are told now, I mean, it's a bargaining position. You know, the president has gone all out saying what their one thing that they really want out of this is tax increases on, you know, to, to reverse the Bush tax cuts, essentially, on, on the wealthy. Um, and, you know, be, as the party in power and as a responsible party, they don't want to go into another recession. Um, and they also, you know, have also drawn a line in the sand at the 250000 I would say that's not middle class, but that's another issue. Whatever, they, they won't go below that. Um, and, uh, and they generally are, uh, you know, don't want to drastically shrink the size of government in general. Um, and they go along with some things that I would consider to be, uh, you know, con leading to the end of New Deal programs, but they're not, it's not a, you know, something that they would generally prefer. Um, but that's the danger point is, you know, how many Democrats um, are sincerely worried about the deficit and, are, and believe, genuinely believe that uh, it is important to cut the social insurance programs to achieve that. Um, the, um, so the, the danger, so, you know, objectively, the Democrats have the upper hand because if you, you know, the thing that happens automatically, the main, you know, is the, is the expiration of the tax cuts. And so, you know, as somebody pointed out earlier, that's this, it's, it's sort of, um, part of it is it becomes, it's semantic. You now call, you're not, you're now arguing about who gets another, you know, who gets a tax cuts restored as opposed to talking about a tax increase, which when you're talking, you know, with Republicans might be something, um, but it's, you know, the, the, the tax increases would be a done deal, which is an, an argument, again, for not trying to strike a bargain before these things take effect. Um, the thing where the Democrats are vulnerable is, again, all, if the, um, it, even though it is a slope, it is going to hurt the economy. It's not going to happen overnight. We're not going to go into a major recession overnight, but, it, you know, the Democrats clearly don't want to sacrifice unemployed workers and every, you know, and the economy as a whole to, uh, you know, uh, and so that's, that's where they're vulnerable. And, um, and this is hyper simplified. I mean, I don't even mention, you know, the, the tax increase is not just the Bush tax cuts, but it's the payroll tax cut, which I can talk about later. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, unemployment is another big factor there, the un, uh, extended unemployment. Um, so uh, the, um, you know, sort of a uh, point, ah, okay. Um, well, okay, I'm gonna skip ahead, but just a couple of uh, points to be made here. Um, you, know, we're, you know, economists are all glad that now they're sort of, or Keynesians are glad that, that there's an implicit, um, uh, you know, the, the, the whole discussion around the fiscal cliff implies 
um, that, that you're a Keynesian, that you really believe that the economy is going to go uh, south if you, um, if you close the deficit, even though it's not usually stated in those words. Um, you know, a couple, of, a couple of details are, you know, yes, generally speaking, all else equal, you, close, you, short, you reduce the deficit, you um, will have a, a, you know, a contractionary effect, but the, how you do it matters a lot. If you uh, actually, you know, the, famously the tax cuts on the wealthy were not very expansionary um, versus tax cuts on the middle class. Actually, what even better than any of that is spending on states, spending on infrastructure, which is another thing this panel is supposed to talk about. The, you know, extended unemployment. These things don't cost very much and they have a big effect on jobs. So, um, and then the other point, is, this is a point that my, our, my boss, uh, the research director at EPI, Josh Bishman, makes out, you know, is that since a lot of Democrats really do believe that deficit reduction, long-term deficit reduction is, is important and there's, you know, some literature that points to that you get to the point where you know, debt as a share of GDP, you know, then all of a sudden things go bad for the economy. And looking carefully at these studies, they're not, they're not really very credible. But in any case, the point being that even if you believe that, even if you believe that debt to GDP at a certain point becomes dangerous for the economy, you know, this assumes that you've got full employment. And um, so it's a high class kind of problem. You can worry about that then. You know, it's not, you know, what we've got to worry about is years and years and years of less than full employment. Um, and okay, so uh, since I, um, I will skip ahead to very quickly, I would just like to get to my uh, uh, Social Security. Um, the, uh, the thing about Social Security is people have been convinced, and this is why they want to deal and they want to include Social Security, is I think that we've reached the high point of scaremongering on Social Security. People are really convinced that, that Social Security and Medicare together, you know, are going to, um, are going to uh, you know, bankrupt us in the future. And health, you know, Medicare, it's all health care. And it doesn't, you know, if we don't solve that problem, we've got a problem, whether it's a government spending or it's private spending. So we've got healthcare cost inflation is the number one problem. The um, aging is really not that big of a problem. With Social Security, we've saved money in the trust fund to get us past most of the peak boomer retirement years. Life expectancy growth is so moderate as a factor compared to other things that once the baby boomers retire, cost as a share of GDP, level off, you can't with your naked eye see any growth. I mean, there is a little bit of growth because of life expectancy, but it's very minor. The chief actuary of Social Security will tell you that if there's a demographic problem, it's the drop off in, in births, not, you know, and in, 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 in population growth, which has to do with immigration and the birth rate, and not with life expectancy. And for the record, I'm in favor of uh, gradually increasing the payroll tax to offset increases in life expectancy because it would be so slow and so modest that it wouldn't be much of a tax increase and it would sort of shut people up altogether. Um, but usually, of course, it's used as an excuse for uh, raising the retirement age, um, which is an across the board cut and well beyond what would be necessary to offset uh, growth in life expectancy. And, you know, I have written a lot about this issue, so I would just refer you to other stuff I've written because it does, it is very hard to convince people this is not true. It's true, life expectancy at birth has risen very much since the early days of Social Security, but a lot of other things have happened in that time, notably, you know, influx of women in the workplace, people working longer already, you know, that have tended to balance off the sort of demographic issues. Um, and it turns out that a big reason for the, the, that the, the Social Security shortfall has emerged has actually had to do more with slow uh, wage growth and uh, wage inequality, so more earnings above the cap. Um, and um, so... Uh, One minute, okay. nine minutes to go. Okay, and so the, la the last point I make then uh, will be that... Um, the, uh, well, the, I'll make two last points. One of them is that, you know, the other reason that Social Security and Medicare tend to be hit is that people look at it and they're like, okay, social insurance or mandatory spending is, say, 14% of, you know, of GDP. Uh, you know, discretionary spending, including military spending, is 9%. You know, that's where the, you know, you have to go where the money is. But what gets left out here is tax expenditures, which are about 8% of GDP and sort of don't, don't, they're not considered spending, they're a reduction in taxes. Um, but that is where there's a lot of waste. Democrats have been complicit in it. You know, a lot, of, for example, why cut Social Security instead of talk, cutting subsidies for 401ks, two-thirds of which go 
to the top 20% of the population. And in general, that's the case for most tax expenditures. Very, very lopsided, very wasteful, very inefficient. And today's New York Times uh, had something about how the Democrats, you know, the, it was actually something that the Republicans were pushing during the election, um, and the Democrats are now easing up to it. And there's no reason, if somebody tells you, you know, that Social Security is the um, third rail, you know, that why is it, why is it that the home interest deduction or the um, you know 401k subsidies are considered untouchable, but Social Security really isn't. I mean, it, it's because Pete Peterson has spent a lot of money, and I, I should own up that EPI you know has also worked with Pete Peterson on stuff like this. But we don't agree on this. But you know, to try to uh, scare people about this one particular problem and convince people that it's you know we have to touch that third rail. Um, I'm just going to wrap up with just to be provocative. Uh, generally speaking, this has been of a love fest. Everybody's agreed. I want to give Bruce Bartlett a bear hug. I don't think he's here anymore. Since the way I sound, he probably wouldn't want it, although I don't think I'm contagious anymore. I've had this cold for about a week. Um, but there are three areas, I think, that are important where you know, progressives disagree and people on this panel disagree. Uh, we disagree with CAP. We disagree with Center on Budget, you know, potential areas, and it might be interesting to discuss. One of them is, generally speaking, the importance of, of deficit reduction. I mean, I've laid it out. We tend to be dovish on this. I don't think it's a problem for a long time to come, not really worried about interest rates. Um, the other area is, um, you know, as part of that is one area that where a lot of progressives are willing to cut Social Security is by reducing the cost of living adjustment. EPI is actually behind a statement right now. We're trying to get PhD economists to sign. If you haven't signed already, we're releasing it later this week, but we have about 300 people who've signed on to something, um, you know, saying we, it's, it's a cut in benefits, and it's a, it's a particularly bad one. It goes to the, the most elderly beneficiaries uh, disproportionately. Um, but the reason that some progressives favor this is because it would also increase revenues because the same thing would happen on, you know, on, uh, in terms of marginal tax brackets. So this is an area of disagreement. Another area of disagreement is whether to ex you know, extend the payroll tax cut. And within my own organization, there's disagreement there. Um, you know, we all want, we're worried about the economy. It's one way that they do it, but I do believe that it's a Republican trap to um, make, uh, you know, to make it seem like, to cut the, you know, it, it, it could turn out to be a, uh, uh, something hard to get out of. But thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, What makes a bargain grand? We, according to press reports, uh, President Obama would like to have a grand bargain. Uh, the most uh, familiar template of a grand bargain is uh, the Simpson-Bowles plan, uh, uh, written by the two co-chairs of the uh, Presidential Commission on the Budget, whose members rejected the very plan that the co-chairs wrote. Uh, uh, this is now uh, being pushed by a, a coalition uh, called Fix the Debt, funded by the billionaire Pete Peterson, uh, and uh, to the tune of more than $30 million, uh, funded by a number of corporations, particularly in the financial industry, uh, but not exclusively. That the, uh, the basic template of that and similar grand bargain deals is that in return for averting the fiscal cliff, averting what some have called more accurately the austerity bomb uh, in the near future, uh, Congress will agree to long-term cuts in entitlements uh, which do not include tax expenditures, uh, even though people are entitled to them, but they do include social insurance programs, as uh, Monique uh, pointed out, uh, social insurance, Medicare, and Medicaid. So in all of the different versions of a grand bargain, long-term cuts to uh, Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid are considered part of the deal, whatever the other details of the deal may be. Uh, and well, why is this urgent? We are told that we need this grand bargain uh, because we have to uh, deal with the immediate explosion of the public debt uh, that has occurred not just since the uh, financial crash of 2008, 2009, uh, but also in the last decade. So if I uh, get this right. Uh, thanks to the Center on Budget and uh, Policy Priorities it has done this very useful uh, chart uh, showing where the uh, components of the uh, explosion of public debt in, in the last decade uh, have come from. Uh, you, you, you may not be able to read it. Uh, basically, it's the Bush tax cuts 
and uh, uh, the unfunded wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which were funded uh, exclusively by borrowing rather than by a mix of borrowing and taxes as in previous wars, make up uh, an enormous chunk of it. The rest uh, is revenue that was lost from the recession simply as uh, individual uh, payroll and, and income tax receipts and corporate income tax receipts went down. Uh, a little sliver for federal spending on uh, the TARP, uh, the bailouts of uh, Freddie, Freddie, uh, Freddie Mac and uh, Fannie Mae, uh, federal unemployment insurance, and so on. Uh, so if you look at, again, this, uh, I'm from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, if you look at this chart to see, well, where was the explosion in Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid spending contributing to this, you can't see it. You can't find it even with a microscope. It's not on there. Uh, social insurance has not contributed at all, uh, with the exception of automatic stabilizers during the recession, uh, <clears throat> Medicaid to some extent, uh, unemployment insurance, uh, to the present crisis. Uh, it's uh, two wars, a recession, and tax cuts, uh, which disproportionately benefited the rich. We are told again and again that uh, we have to urgently deal with this demographic tsunami uh, that's a tidal wave of, of costs which are going to escalate in the near future and bankrupt America because we can't afford spending uh, on the elderly, on Social Security and Medicare. Well, I think if you're a, a oceanographer or even a mere surfer, uh, none of these, and, and this comes from the Washington Post, None of these actually look like a tidal wave. So uh, and it's, I know it's kind of small. It goes out to 2040. Uh, if you just look at uh, uh, the top two, uh, health care spending, uh, public health care spending, uh, uh, Medicare and, and Medicaid, and uh, Social Security, the second chart, if you look at Social Security, as uh, Monique said uh, earlier, uh, it goes from a little less than 5% now to about 6% by the middle of the uh, 21st century. That's not exactly a tsunami that threatens to uh, destroy our, our civilization and calls for immediate urgent action. Uh, what it means is essentially over half a century, uh, we need to either raise revenues uh, by about one and a half percent of GDP, uh, or you, on the alternative, if you want, you could uh, uh, cut Social Security benefits by that amount, or you could have some uh, compromise, uh, or uh, you could uh, think about reform within the context of the retirement system as a whole, and uh, arguably, as, as uh, I would suggest, in expand Social Security, which is the most stable part, uh, at the expense of reductions in the volatile and unstable part of our retirement system, which is tax-favored 401ks, which have done a terrible job uh, compared to Social Security. These are all debates worth having. We have decades to have them. Uh, it, it's true uh, by the 2030s, uh, when the trust fund is exhausted, uh, there will be a drop, and, and Congress, uh, presumably some years in advance, will have to deal with it. Uh, do we have to deal with the Social Security, as, uh, it, its long-term uh, uh, financial outlook in the lame duck session in the next couple of weeks before the holidays, or even by July 4th, uh, which some of these deficit reduction efforts have, have set as their deadline? Uh, evidently not. Uh, there's more of a problem from a fiscal point of view with the rise in Medicare and Medicaid costs, uh, but even this here, we have it uh, going up to uh, 10% by about the year 2040, 10% of GDP from under 5% today. That's not insignificant. That, that's, you know, uh, a significant amount of uh, GDP. Uh, do we really, are we confident that uh, we know what share of GDP will go to health care, whether it's channeled through public programs like Medicare and Medicaid or through the private sector in the year 2040 AD? I think not. Uh, but in, in fact, th this chart, since it ends at 2040, really does not serve the purposes of scaring people because saying it goes from a little less than five to about 10 in 40 years is not terribly frightening and, and apocalyptic. And for that reason, the uh, scaremongers and the doomsayers about uh, Medicare and Medicaid typically use a chart that goes out to the 2080s, uh, where, as uh, James Galbraith said in a, a panel earlier this morning, that way you can have these uh, costs extrapolated up to 40%, which is, is scarier than 10% in 40 years, 40% in 80 years. 
you know, conceivably, I don't, I don't know if anyone's done the experiment, maybe you could project it out to the year 2200 AD and show that it would be 200% of GDP, <laughs> right? The point is, do the, are these projections, well, yes, we will have to act at some point, or unless new technology or delivery system reform or something solves the problem, which is quite conceivable. Is it really urgent that we try to settle this problem to the extent that it's a problem uh, between now and the holidays or in the, in the spring of 2013? Uh, again, it would seem to me a rational person would ask, you know, this is kind of like uh, saying, well, you know, your parents had a, a, a cancer when they were 60, so as, at, at the age of 20, you should go ahead and have an operation just in case, right? You know, uh, just to make sure. Uh, uh, it might develop in 30 or 40 years. Well, then why is it, and this is ultimately a political question, it's not an economic question, why is anyone talking about fixing Social Security and Medicare in the next six months? Or the next, for that matter, five or, or six weeks uh, as part of a grand bargain? Why are we even discussing this? And even if there were a few irrational people saying these sorts of things, uh, why would anyone take it seriously? Uh, well, I, I think uh, this shows the answer. This is one of the ways that you can cut Social Security benefits uh, that have been discussed as a possible part of the grand bargain. Monique uh, mentioned another one, raising eligibility ages. There are various ways you can cut it. Uh, this is using a chained CPI, Consumer Price Index. Uh, it's an alternate measure of inflation. Uh, I'm not an econometrician. I, I defer to uh, uh, the experts on what is the best measure of inflation. The point is this actually appeals to individuals and organizations who want long-term Social Security cuts because it gets the results they want. Uh, it essentially, uh, by calculating inflation differently, you allow inflation to erode the real value of Social Security benefits over time. Now notice that the erosion of Social Security benefits by chain CPI is a cumulative, uh, and it gets worse and worse as you get older. So when you're 65, it's uh, less than 1%. If you live to be 95, assuming this system has been adopted, uh, then it's a nearly 10% cut in your benefits uh, compared to today. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to debate the merits of this. Uh, there, you know, you can make the case in favor of it. I'm just gonna make a political point. Uh, if you had a separate national conversation on what to do about Social Security over three or four years, and there was no rush, and there was no deadline, and there was no sense of urgency, and you had commissions, and they came up with proposals, and then there was legislation in Congress, I think it would be a lot more difficult to sell this to the public, right? To say that, you know, we're not gonna talk about any other aspects of the budget. All we're gonna talk about is Social Security, and our plan is to cut Social Security benefits through stealth inflation tax by 10% for 95-year-olds vote for us, right? I don't think that would be very popular. Uh, and the same can, is true of a lot of uh, other uh, Medicare reforms which involve not reducing the price of, of uh, medical goods and services in the US which are overpriced by OECD standards, uh, not improving delivery system efficiency, but just rationing access. If you had a separate freestanding national conversation with no deadline, no sense of urgency, what to do about the future of Medicare and Medicaid, and one uh, group just set up, uh, said, we want massive permanent rationing of access to health care. Uh, again, that's not going to go anywhere. So if you favor cutting entitlements like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid uh, you by me methods like this, uh, it makes perfect sense for you want to bury this in the fine print of legislation on another subject like averting the fiscal cliff. It's just like putting a rider on a Defense Department bill for something that has nothing whatsoever to do with the Defense Department. That is, I think that the, the groups in the United States, which for ideological reasons, in the case of some parts of the financial industry for pecuniary reasons, want to cut social insurance and force people to buy more private for-profit uh, sector uh, pr uh, products like annuities or uh, uh, private health insurance, they know they can't win this argument 
if the grand bargain is unbundled, if these are separate debates. Uh, their best chance uh, is to, to, first of all, create a completely artificial sense of urgency. We have to do all of this now. The clock is ticking, you know, by December 31st or by July 3rd, 2013. And second, uh, to bury this, right, to bury the cuts uh, in, like, some grand comprehensive package, which will include uh, tax increases, avert the alternate minimum tax, uh, avert the sequestration, and all of that. It is a, it, I have to say, it's a brilliant political strategy. Uh, it's probably the only political strategy that can achieve what they want, uh, because uh, unless they ram this through in a hurry, uh, if you have a mini deal instead of a grand bargain, uh, which sets aside the long-term entitlement reform and focuses only on the immediate uh, obstacle course of, of various issues, we will revisit uh, all of these things, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, for generations to come. Uh, but you won't have that sense of urgency, and you won't have the ability to uh, ram through a lot of ill-considered, ill-debated questions uh, in the middle of the night right before a deadline. Thank you. Uh, it's always a challenge to follow my esteemed colleague, Michael Lind, who serves as policy director for our economic growth program and, and has headed up also our next social contract initiative over the last couple of years. Uh, I want to come back to the question that Basil um, Scarless posed to the first panel. And in doing so, I want to talk about what I believe is the actually most fundamental flaw in the grand bargain as represented by Simpson Bowles. Now, if you remember Basil's question is whether there is not a trade-off between uh, public investment, particularly growth enhancing public investment in infrastructure, education, research and development, and meeting our, our uh, <coughs> uh, social security and Medicare uh, ob obligations. And my argument is that in that this is indeed a false trade-off. And moreover, that both are necessary. Increasing spending are both necessary over the next five to 10 years for, to have a successful uh, economy and, and to sustain economic growth. Now, the uh, grand bargain proponents would, in, in a sense, try to pit people in, in generally the center-left community between those who favor uh, increasing spending or maintaining s levels of spending on education, research and development and infrastructure versus people who want to defend the New Deal pro programs. But in, but in fact, this only shows or should lead us to, to understand where the fundamental flaw is in, in the grand bargain uh, position. And that, fundamental flaw is that, in a sense, the Simpson-Bowles framework attempts to impose a failed model of economic growth on us in perpetuity that may not be appropriate. Now, what is that essential model of economic growth? Well, in essence, they're calling for, for uh, lowering the tax rates as if tax rates and this supply side magic is the key to economic growth. Yes, they're broadening the base by cutting certain tax expenditure, trying to increase efficiency. But the overall <coughs> thrust of their, their message <coughs> is to keep tax rates low, keep public spending low, to prevent public spending from crowding out private investment as if capital is scarce in the world. But this is not the, the economic conditions that we face now or that we will face over the next five to eight years. Beyond, beyond eight years, I won't venture 
to extrapolate because as Jamie Galbraith pointed out, some of these trends become discontinuous after a, a cert, certain, certain point. Uh, but what I do want to do want to stress here is that this model of economic growth, a, a mild version of the supply side uh, economic philosophy that has guided economic policy for much of the last decade or two, is fundamentally ill-suited for the economic conditions that we will face over the next five to eight years. And indeed, uh, these economic conditions, I would argue, call for greater sustained public spending, both increased spending on growth enhancing public in, in investment and increased spending on social security and public funded health care. I want to touch on the six trends that I believe will define our economic conditions over the next five to eight years and then explain why, in effect, I've come to the conclusion that we need both increased public investment and increased spending on social support programs and New Deal programs in order to have robust or sufficiently robust economic growth. The first trend is the obvious one that we're still in the early stages of a global deleveraging process. In the U.S., the, the best measures suggest we're near, maybe nearly halfway there in household deleveraging. De but Europe has just begun. China has not even begun to confront its deleveraging problem it will have after the buildup of non-performing loans, which will become more apparent as we go on. So the consequences of this is in the, in the, U the U.S., of which we face another three to five to eight years of private sector household deleveraging, but also face a worldwide problem of weak external demand, that we will, <clears throat> we will have a process of paying down debt that destroys demand in the private sector, also weakening private investment. Therefore, otherwise, we would expect weak economic growth. Second, we have two demographic trends that are intersecting. We hear about a lot about the aging problem, but in fact, in the interim five to eight period, year period, we have two demographic uh, trends that are going to exacerbate the supply-demand equation and imbalance in the global economy and increase the relative weight of savings versus versus uh, demand for investment. First, we have the emerging economies, many of which are already high saving and producer oriented economies, will enter their peak savings and production period. Yes, consumption will increase in those societies, but if those patterns fall other demographics, the actual proportion of savings will actually increase in many of those societies. The Goldman Sachs study on this two or three years ago, I believe, is impeccable and everyone should, should read it. This will occur at the same time that we're having a period of private savings catch up in most of the advanced industrialized countries. Most of the baby boomers have five to 10 years left of earning capacity. Most of them have undersaved. Many of them are going to be saving more to catch up, and because uh, many of them face uh, problems created by repeated market uh, setbacks. So you're going to have abundant capital, and in particular, you're going to have a shortage of fixed income investments, which are going to complicate the, the, the retirement income planning planning process. That means that you'll have an enormous demand for U.S. Treasury debt yet in the world, partly because you'll have problems in other parts of the world. The third trend is that you're going to have the ongoing mechanization and automation of manufacturing and business services, not just in the U.S., but, but, but globally as well. And what this is going to do is reduce the demand for labor 
and, and the available of middle income jobs. At some point in the US, we will reach certain limits about automation and, and, and even will maybe face some slowdown in productivity growth. But we still have a long ways to go in terms of, of, of the fact that machines are still replacing labor in, in many parts of our economy. Therefore, labor will be abundant, employment and jobs will be very constrained, and we will continue to face distributive challenges of pressures of technological change giving rise to rising inequality or continued inequality. <clears throat> the fourth trend is that absent a more complete breakdown of globalization, we're going to have continued intense global competition in the traded sectors of, the, of both the advanced and, and newly emerged economies, which will result or place limits on company-specific research and development and infrastructure investment. That means more of the burden for R&D and infrastructure investment actually will fall to government and the public sector in the future. Simultaneously, we're going to have continued financial constraints at the state level in the United States, which means that, that the federal government will have to compensate for cutbacks at the state level in education and other, other uh, necessary investments as well as, uh, as support for for social programs. Finally, and this is one is slightly more optimistic, but continuing with the theme of uh, abundance, we will see <clears throat> the development of an energy surplus because of technological advances in, in exploiting uh, both oil and natural gas resources combined with, with new energy efficiency measures that will greatly reduce U.S. energy use. Now, the U.S. has now predicted, the International Energy Agency predict the U.S. will be, the, will be the, the number one producer of oil by 2020. It will also be probably close to the top in the producers of natural gas. This will give us the wealth and income <coughs> Mike Lynn mentioned one and a half percent of GDP we'd need over the next, uh, what is it, 15 or 20 years to make up for the shortfall in, in, um, in um, Social Security and four to five percent in Medicare. Well, the explosion of a moving from an energy deficit to an energy surplus will more than half close that GDP gap. <coughs> So we have a, a economic conditions that, that suggest that the challenges we face are the exact opposite of what the Bowles-Simpson grand bargain would impose on us as a growth strategy. <clears throat> the conditions that we're going to face over the next five to eight years with some amelioration if we do the right things are an ongoing shortfall of both domestic and global demand, excess capital and labor, and, and, and excess capacity in major, many major industries, overcapacity in many sectors of the world economy, a distributive and inequality challenges caused by ongoing automation. In those circumstances, I would argue, we need both more public investment, but we also need stronger social security and, and public health care programs to ease the distributed challenges, but also to ensure adequate demand and employment in the economy. So more public investment is needed to create jobs to fill the demand hole and to ensure adequate in infrastructure and research development and training. But stronger social support programs are also necessary in, or, in a demand and employment constrained world in order to fill, help further fill the demand hole, 
create jobs, and help correct the inequality and distributed, and distributed justice challenge. In other words, we need a growth strategy that is built on public investment-led growth that will, in fact, help crowd in private investment and fill the demand gap that we face both domestically and globally. Let me make one final point, uh, which goes to the politics. Having said and laid out the economic case for an economic growth strategy that is very different than that would be imposed by Simpson and Bowles. I do understand the, the, the problem of political constraints. The political constraints on public spending, the inability to grasp the, the meaning of, of Stephanie's very important contribution and Jamie's comments earlier today. So that, in effect, we also need mechanisms that will allow us to expand the budget, bu budget multipliers, if you will. And the principal budget multipliers would result from the revival of my, what my colleague Mike Lind calls the public purpose finance in the US. Jamie mentioned that private finance in many respects is still broken. And at the same time, we have suffocated are public purpose finance me mechanisms. The credit, uh, the federal credit programs and guarantee programs that are needed to leverage private capital without putting it on the public balance sheet. So I think the, one of the most important ideas is to support the idea that Bernard Swartz has long supported, which is actually the establishment of a public bank for infrastructure and development which would allow you to leverage private capital and greatly increase uh, public-private uh, infrastructure investment at a time where private companies don't want to undertake it, but to do it in a way that doesn't add immediately to the public debt, only adds to the public debt to the extent that the risk of these projects not failing to, to return. So on that point, I will conclude. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm uh, glad to be here and appreciate being part of this. I'm always uh, in awe of Cheryl's ability to put these uh, issues in the broadest global context um, and uh, really help us think differently about it. I want to, I think I'm going to start by narrowing it down a little bit and bringing us back to some of the more mundane politics here. And one thing that I think hasn't, doesn't come up enough in discussions of the fiscal cliff is actually a reminder of why there is a fiscal cliff. Uh, why are all these things, uh, you know, hitting at once? Um, part of them, as we know, are the some of the temporary uh, stimulus measures in the early Obama administration and uh, and also in 2011 uh, that were uh, you know temporary tax cuts that were designed to give the economy a boost that are by their nature temporary and should be revisited and you know we may conclude that the economy still needs that that boost and that's totally appropriate. Uh, some of it is the alternative minimum tax that's always that's basically always broken and always needs uh, some changes to it. Um, the sequesters uh, on on domestic and and defense spending are products of the blackmail episode of 2011 um, when congressional leaders refused to uh, uh, enter, refused to do as as is routinely done and extend the uh, the debt limit and created this uh, the sequester as a way to force some action that they had no intention of of doing themselves. But the biggest part of it uh, comes from the Bush tax cuts. And the reason the Bush tax cuts expire is, is, a sim is an interesting story. Uh, in 2001 and 2003, uh, in 2001, we had a, we had a, a budget surplus. Uh, and uh, both Democrats and Republicans wanted to cut taxes. Democrats wanted to cut them by about half as much and, uh, and put more emphasis on the middle class, less on uh, tax cuts for the rich. Uh, Republicans. Did not only wanted the, they, you know, they wanted what we have, and they didn't want to be in a position where they had to compromise with Democrats at all under any circumstances. Even though they probably, you know, a, a reasonable compromise would certainly have 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 passed. In fact, their 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 own bill might have passed, but they didn't even want to risk that, and so they used the procedure known as budget reconciliation to pass those tax cuts with just with just 50 votes in the Senate and avoid having any kind of of compromise. 
The problem is the only way you can use that process of budget reconciliation is you can't you can't do anything that increases the deficit in what's called in the out years, in the years beyond the ten year budget window. So they made them they didn't want them to expire, but they made them expire in order to use that process. So you have something that begins as a you know, deeply aggressive political maneuver that has now turned into, as, I, as, as Jamie said in the opening and others have said here, has now turned into a kind of, uh, a, a different kind of tool, uh, one that's designed to force action on uh, some budget decisions that, uh, as, as Mike said, would not be the actions we would take otherwise. Um, so that by creating the fiscal cliff, we're now under the gun in a place where if decisions that are likely to be made on, in a sense, we're using these tax and other things as leverage to on on Social Security and Medicare in particular to force uh, to force some changes that we might not make otherwise, uh, such as raising at eligibility ages, uh, implementing this chain CPI or other ideas that uh, you know that are kind of what you do if you're if, if if you have to throw something together in the middle of the night in order to avoid yet another uh, another blackmail episode. Um, so it's really I think it's important to recognize that when you think about the fiscal cliff, it's not a natural phenomenon. It's something that was created by a series of a, a series of decisions, um, which which you know many of which should really shouldn't have happened. Um, and then, you know, once we're on the other side of the fiscal cliff, not only do we have some room to, to think about these issues in a different way, there are also some pretty good things that, that fall into place on the other side of the fiscal cliff. For example, uh, people were talking for, you know, in the campaign, you heard both uh, Romney and at different times Obama has talked about some kind of overall cap on deductions in, um, in, in on, on the deductions that individuals can take. Well, guess what? We had something Roughly similar to that, mostly for high-end earners, the two provisions known as P's and PEP. Those were those have been out of effect since the Bush tax cuts. They would come back into effect on the other side of the fiscal cliff. Not a bad thing. Capital gains tax rate goes up from 15 percent, where it's encouraging all the maneuvers that you see if you looked at the Romney tax returns, for example, all the carried interest loophole, the hedge fund loophole, all of those are products of the fact that we have such a low capital gains rate and the incentives to define income as capital gains are so high, capital gains rate goes up, goes up to 20 percent. That's not, it should be at the same level as other income. But that's that's some progress. Dividend rate goes goes up to the level of, of normal income. Those are good things um, on the other side of the fiscal cliff. Obviously, there there are things that that, that we that you'd want to change. You'd want to restore some of the the child tax credit and the and the refundable child tax credit and the and and the middle tax, class tax cuts and so forth. But there's a lot of good on the other side of the of the of the fiscal cliff. And there's also an opportunity there, I think, to to think and talk about Medicare and Social Security. In the in the way that Michael was suggesting, with a little more uh, rationality uh, to it, I, I'm often worried uh, that we do treat these programs as you know sacred and untouchable, uh, and and I don't think that's really appropriate either. Some of us there was a lesson that was sort of overlearned in 2000 in 2005. Progressives did a very smart thing when President Bush proposed privatization of Social Security. They basically said. You know what? We 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 can't play this game. We we all have other interesting ideas about how to improve Social Security. We have the Peter Diamond, Peter Orzag plan. We have a whole bunch of other things. They're all good. We're not. We're just not entering this game. We're not playing on Social Security because we will lose uh, if we do. That was very smart for 2005. Um, but I think as we as we uh, as as we go into a different era different political configuration, uh, I think we can have a little more a little more of the courage to say, you know, Social Security has changed. It basically, it's, it's been changed every other year since, the, since it was created. It was changed about six times by Franklin Roosevelt. It was changed to adjust, you know, in many ways to women entering. The, it changed first to eliminate the, uh, the, uh, the bias against African-American uh, workers, changed to, to uh, reflect the greater role of women in the workplace, and, and so forth. It's been changed dramatically. We, we should be unafraid to, to be willing to, to, to change and improve these programs, not just to cut their costs, but to say, what are they doing well, and how, you know, how do we really achieve these, uh, uh, how do we better achieve the goals of Social Security and Medicare? Um, I, I, last week, uh, right after the election, David Brooks wrote a column which had a, you know, the classic, uh, you know, you agree with some of it, and some of it is absolutely infuriating. Uh, and, and his quote at the end, he basically said, you know, look, to the Republican Party, your attempt to, to, to depict the country as, you know, 
uh, half the people depended on government and half not. You know, it didn't. Re it didn't. Re it didn't uh, resonate with people, and and most people. You know, they they understand that the government can can be helpful to them as well. Uh, he concluded by saying to Republicans, "Don't get hung up on whether federal government is 20 or 22 percent of GDP." Let the Democrats be the party of security defending the 20th century welfare state. You be the party that celebrates work and inflames enterprise. That's the classic portrayal that these, you know, what we're defending here is just these crusty old programs. All they do is provide security so that, you know, and they don't have anything to do with, you know, actually lifting people up into the workplace. Nothing could be further than the truth. And we really need to get out there and really establish the point that, you know, Real economic opportunity comes from having security. It comes from having the security of, you know, that your health care isn't dependent on your job so you can uh, take advantage of other opportunities, of knowing that at least a portion of your of your retirement savings is is secure. You know, if it was all up to you, you'd have to make some of it, you'd have to put some of it in the securest uh, uh, form of T-bill, something something like that. So so that base is really important to your ability to take other economic risks and, and take chances, and I think we really need to... Uh, uh, to establish that. Um, and, and on Medicare, obviously, I think it is, regardless of how cons of, of where we see the budget deficit, I think a path that puts us to Medicare taking five, per, you know, spending 5.7 percent of GDP uh, in 2035, as projected, and, and I'm, I, I'm as skeptical as anybody of, of how projections work, but, you know, we don't want to get to that point. That's not a good use of our national, of, of, of our, that's not a good statement of our priorities. Um, but there, there are ways to get there uh, by properly implementing the Affordable Care Act, begins to, begins to show which are the kind of cost savings that actually do work and don't work, and which uh, can, be, can be blended into a uh, to Medicare and 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 also into 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 Medicaid to begin to re to reduce those costs. I, uh, it would certainly be. I, I saw the other day. Christina Romer said, you know, raising the eligibility age for Medicare could be okay because you know the the Affordable Care Act is going to cover people. Um, uh, up up to that age, which is which is my my feeling is that might be, but we are nowhere near being able to say for sure that that's going to work in a way that will support people uh, in that age. And I think we really want to think about in, in in basically saying how can we make these programs work better to allow people to you know take full advantage of their own. Um, of their of their own aspirations and 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 really live live a better life. We really want to look closely at what what's happening. What are we doing for, for people in that age range of say 58, 62 up to 65? Um, uh, Jamie Galbraith, when I was at the American Prospect, we, he he we published a great piece by him suggesting that you know with a with the pressures on young people, the difficulty for young people finding employment, maybe we should just actually make it much easier for people to. Uh, to, to step most mo, all or partially out of the workforce uh, at age 62 without the penalty that uh, that that kicks in in order to in encourage that I think that's that's one interesting idea we're certainly seeing a lot of people in that age range with you know, that's where the you know a lot of the long-term unemployment is concentrated um, you see you know two-thirds of people are already taking social security benefits at age 62 there's there are points where that's economically rational or not, I'm guessing a large portion of those people are not making a rational economic decision about how to do that. It's just they're in a situation at 62 where they need that cash. And I think that's a population where we need to think about what's a what's a way to, to ease that uh, that transition from, um, you know, the later years of working life uh, towards retirement and po possibly some other savings vehicles might be part of that answer within within Social Security. Um, and I also think we ought to be willing, there's an interesting part of the uh, never touch Social Security reaction, sometimes from progressives, is there's a, re a reluctance to really embrace increases in the payroll tax at the high end. I've certainly uh, held that view at times because it creates something. We think that Social Security only works because you know, basically, it's a good deal for everybody. Um, it's not. It has a certain amount of progressivity in it, but not so much that it, that uh, that anybody is really uh, is really worse off. It's not a. It's not a, a massively redistributive program. The more you raise the payroll tax, of course, the more it does become a redistributive program. If you're not changing benefits uh, in the same way, so that if you're you know if you're raising the ceiling on the payroll tax, for example, you create some you create a population of well-off people for whom 
that Social Security payment becomes a little bit more of a bad deal, depending how high you go. I've always been wary of that, uh, but I think in keeping with that, with the principle of let's be unafraid to make some changes, I think we should maybe be less, be less wary of it. I think the public is, is, is less unwilling it, it, the public more rec the public has more recognition that we do support we, you know we do have programs that redistribute that support people who have less that that others pay, others pay more you see it in the public support for programs like like the state child children's health insurance program i think there's a willingness to accept that so I, that i don't think we have to kind of cling to the funding model of social security uh, exactly as it is um, and should be willing to entertain some of those payroll tax increases but all of that is on the other side of the fiscal cliff thank you So I think, uh, I guess the, the format is if people have questions, so they can go to the mics. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, start off with a, a kind of a, it's not a yes or no, because there's three choices, but um, a, a question just to run down the panel. In terms of the fiscal cliff, big deal, small deal, go off the cliff. What, what, uh, what's your preference? I would say small deal. I, my, my only, I understand the logic that if you go off the cliff, then you know the th third week of January, you can then claw back, uh, uh, you know, make uh, tax cuts and all of that. I do th think you have to worry about uh, business uh, confidence and, and markets and, and that sort of thing. Maybe that's exaggerated, but I would go for a small deal. Mark? Off the cliff. Off the cliff. Off the cliff. Oh. What was the first choice? Big, small cliff. I, I actually think it's a bigger deal than maybe the consensus here, because I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of the uh, people I know who are barely making ends meet, and they're going to be shocked come January 15th when they get their next paycheck, and they're going to see uh, 50 to $100 less, and that will mean the difference between making the rent, paying the telephone bill, or not. And that's going to have a much bigger, you know, th th there's the business uncertainty, but there's also the, the consumer uncertainty for large numbers of people that are going to be uh, dramatically impacted by even a fairly small increase in the payroll tax and some, some increase in, in, in the withholding. I'm saying this also at a time where, at least my reading of the economy, while we saw some, a few encouraging signs, We've seen a lot of peaking of economic activity in the July through September period, and a lot of, a lot of trends that are now turning downward. So the economy is also vulnerable. So I think it's a bigger deal than, than <clears throat> now we shouldn't be rushed into making a bad grand bargain. That, that's clear. But we should be concerned, in my view, about falling off the cliff. The bigger the deal, the more opportunity to do good, as, more, as well as the bigger the risk of <coughs> bad things happening, is, I mean, sort of my perspective. I'm for a good deal. Uh, we'll start there. Yes, um, I'm very sympathetic with the main messages uh, this morning. On um, one point of fact, which I believe is small, the budget effect of the Medicare Part D program passed in 2003, um, the CBPP chart showed earlier did not include any budget impact from that. It blamed wars, tax cuts, et cetera, which is pretty legit. Even Chuck Grassley, uh, Senator Grassley, who played a major role in passing that law, said later uh, when he was asked, why didn't we pay for it? He said, well, at the time, it was the custom not to pay for things, <laughs> which I think is one of the single most outrageous statements of the last 10 years. That was the largest expansion of social insurance programs in a generation. It was a really big deal and it wasn't paid for. I also was working a lot on legislative transparency at the time. It was one of the least read and most ill, uh, um, ill put together bills, major bills that the Congress has ever passed, or at least in the last uh, 40 years or something. Um, and I, I think it's worth, you know, even if you believe every dime the Medicare Part D program spends is great, my mother benefited and everything, I think we should acknowledge that it was not paid for and it's not the way we want to do these kind of programs and and in it, I don't know I, I just think as a point of fact it was a big deal and it ought to be counted and I think that CBPP chart is actually um, misleading and wrong. I 
I, okay, I can't, I've looked at the CVP chart, though not recently. I, I know we had capped at a similar chart, and it certainly included that increase in spending. It, it's, it, it didn't get its own section, but it was in the sort of increased spending under President Bush category. In fairness, is the CVPP, which you guys do excellent work, aren't you hiding that major new entitlement program as a political thing? Well, I don't um, think anyone thinks it will explode, you know, more than... The, you know, like the other programs yeah. in, in general. Uh, but, but, even, but even if that's the case, our, con our whole conversation is about how do we pay, and for this case, drugs, right? Not about how much do they cost. And this is what we actually have to have a national conversation about. Uh, medical goods and services in general in the United States, physician fees, hospital stays, uh, pharmaceuticals, cost much more than they do in every other OECD country, including Canada. That's not universally the case, but that's generally the case. Well, why is that? There is a consensus in the scholarly literature that no one in public life, Democrat or Republican, you know, talking head on TV, can ever mention, which is that every other industrial country has price controls, basically. It, it regulates the prices of medical goods and services by means of something called all-payer regulation, uh, the government negotiates with representatives of the hospitals, the pharma companies, and the physicians every couple of years, every two or three years. They set rates, and apodectomy costs this much, and aspirin costs this much, uh, and then that's what it is in Canada or Germany or Japan until there's the new round of negotiation. Uh, I, I've gone for years to uh, discussions in Washington about health care cost reform, and it comes up with more general practitioners, you know, this delivery reform, that delivery reform, that's not actually the way it's done. Now, not to say that those can't contribute, uh, but until we're willing to do what the rest of the industrial world does, and that's to have essentially utility-style rate regulation of the medical industry, treating it as a utility where the government does set prices. Uh, what we have is a hybrid system where uh, Medicare does this. It has its own uh, fees. But then you have the private system jacks up prices in order to reach their predetermined targets of what a doctor should make or what the pharma company profit should be. Uh, and unless we have that conversation, the entire conversation is going to be about rationing access to overpriced medical goods and services in America rather than lowering prices without rationing access. So I apologize, I'm getting the high sign that it's uh, t a time to wrap up. So for those of you who had questions, might be able to grab people on the way out. Um, uh, so thank you and thank uh, the panelists. We all know why, on what broad principles and values the election was fought. He has nothing left to prove politically. This is not a head game, and one can be fairly confident he knows that. It's about doing the right thing, taking the time, redefining the discourse, and setting a new course of action. We at EPS, Economists for Peace and Security, hope that this symposium has made a useful contribution to that process, bringing some clarity to these highly charged and in some cases deliberately confusing questions. I think it has made that contribution and that is thanks to the exceptional crispness and clarity of the uh, participants on our three panels. I want to thank them. I want to thank the moderators, um, Michael, Richard, and Stan for doing a terrific job of uh, keeping us on course. I would like to thank you in the audience for attending and for your questions, for your participation. Um, I'd like to thank Josh Friedman of the New America Foundation for his help and assistance with the program and with important parts of the logistics. I need to thank Ellie Warren in the back here of EPS and our director, Taya Harvey, who always does an impeccable job with these symposia. And finally, I would once again like to thank Bernard Schwartz uh, for his uh, support and friendship 
and help with everything that we do over the years. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And we are adjourned.